You're listening to the St. John's Dumb and Creek podcast. This episode presented by Senior Minister Tim Johnson. Hello, brothers and sisters. Good morning. We are the Lim's family. I am Joseph Lim. Hi, I'm April. I'm Josea and I'm 18 years old. I am Josea and I'm 14 years old. We are so grateful that God has given us this opportunity to get to know you, brothers and sisters, at St. John Anglican Church in Melbourne, Australia. It is a privilege to serve with you. St. John has been our partner since 2006 after we came back from EQIP linguistic training at Wycliffe Kangaroo Ground. It, it has been around 15 years now. And we are so thankful for your faithful support through prayers and fun. You are also in our prayers. We live in a small town in Papua called Santani, and I'm serving as a translation consultant, checking translations with several Papuan languages and some languages outside Papua. And I'm serving as a facilitator to help crafting oral Bible stories in vernacular languages. Besides translation works, Joseph and I serve at a local churches with discipleship, mentoring, teaching, and preaching. We are helping them to develop small groups and training them to serve others as well. Recently, we have been working at home due to the pandemic situation. However, through these hard times, God has opened other doors for us to serve uh, the local people more effectively, which is through Zoom meetings. Each week, we meet up with six different small groups via Zoom calls, teaching and discipling them. The pandemic situation is not getting better as more people are getting infected with the virus, but we know that God is in control. Thank God. Last week, July 13th to 18th, I've just finished checking translations of the Hebrew letter in Tado language. We work with the translation team in the central Sulawesi island uh, via Zoom. Also, during this COVID situation, we have been using our time learning and growing spiritually from hearing many good Bible sermons and lessons through online courses. And as for me, I just graduated from high school and I'm planning to attend Moody Bible Institute. I thank God that I found God's calling to be a missionary pilot and will be taking online courses for this semester and hoping to continue my studies in America when this global pandemic situation gets better. I also thank God that I've received many donations for my tuition for this semester. Thank you for your prayers. And the passage for this week is from Psalm 119, verse 129 to 136. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words give light and it gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your decrees. Stream of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Amen. Well, good day, everyone. How great is it to have the, uh, the Liam family do the Bible reading uh, for us uh, from Papua? Uh, my name's Tim Johnson. I'm the Senior Minister, uh, and I'm going to be looking at that passage uh, with us today. Well, 2020 has been a pretty tough year, hasn't it? Um, back at the start of the year, you might have bought yourself one of these, 2020 Diary, useless. 
Oh, oh. Um, all of our plans have been disrupted, uh, thrown out the window. Uh, and even when we, we thought we were getting back to uh, activities, something like normal life again, now we're back in stage three restrictions, back into lockdown. Uh, last week, uh, our family was away in Point Lonsdale on a bit of a holiday uh, when the news came in that we were going back into uh, increased restrictions. Uh, and it was tough news. And as we drove back into Melbourne, we passed the police cordon just near Werribee, knowing that we were going back into an area where we'd be in lockdown again with online schooling uh, and increased restrictions. 2020 has been a really tough year. Uh, and this meme that I came across recently, I think captures it pretty well. Uh, from the movie Back to the Future, uh, Doc Brown saying to Marty McFly, listen carefully, Marty, whatever you do, don't set it for 2020. The DeLorean time machine that could take him anywhere, don't go to 2020. It's a year that you want to avoid. Uh, and it's actually that movie, uh, Back to the Future, which has inspired the title for the new series that we're starting today. Um, admittedly, we, we set this series when we thought the restrictions were lifting and we were trying to think about what it would be like to go back somewhat to normal, uh, back to a new future. Uh, now, of course, restrictions have been reimposed, but we still think it's a good time to actually talk about these things, to talk about what it will be like to go back to what people are calling the new normal. Um, the world has changed. The pandemic has changed the world in real ways. Uh, we won't be going back to the life that we used to live. We're going back to what is called a new normal, or as we framed it for this series, going back to a, a new future. What's that going to look like? Uh, the world will necessarily be changed and some of what the new future will look like uh, will be imposed on us with new awareness about health issues. Uh, we won't be encouraged to push on at work when we've got a sniffle, but to stay well away. Uh, we may never sing happy birthday at kids' birthday parties and blow spit as we blow out the candles all over those cakes anymore. Uh, we may not pay with cash in the future, with physical cash, but be completely cardless because the world has changed and some of what the new future will be will be imposed upon us. But in other ways, there'll be choices too about how we want to do things as we move back to the new normal or move into the new future. Uh, maybe as you've been living under restrictions during this coronavirus period, uh, there's been some things that you have thought, this has been a really good way to do life. Uh, maybe some of the, the old normal hasn't actually been that good and you've enjoyed some of the new things. Uh, in our family, for example, we've embraced the making of sourdough bread, as I know many other people have as well. Abby started that as a school project, uh, but it's been great. Um, the bread tastes really good and, and kneading that dough is really therapeutic, um, especially at the end of a week of online schooling, getting all of that frustration out into the dough. Uh, I've said before that um, coronavirus has really been like, like hitting the, the reset uh, on your phone or your computer. And there'll be a chance to kind of reinstall the operating system, reinstall the software as we think about moving into the new future and what that's going to look like. Now, that takes some thinking for us to do well because our natural tendency is going to be just to go back to the way that we used to do things, what we used to do and how we used to do them. Think about a bit like this, um, a rubber band. The restrictions and coronavirus has sort of stretched us to change and to do things differently. And it's being held in place while the restrictions are in place that we've got to do life a bit differently. But when the restrictions are removed, we naturally snap back just to our default settings as much as we're able to. But maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we realise that the old way of doing things, the old normal, uh, wasn't great. Maybe it wasn't 
godly. Maybe it wasn't healthy. Maybe it wasn't the best thing for us. Uh, Just because something is common, it's the way that everyone does it, doesn't necessarily mean that it's normal. And as we think about the new normal or the new future, we can ask the question, where do we get our normal from? Where do we get our norms from? And as Christians who believe that there is a God, a a God who made the world and who made us and has designed the world in certain ways for us to live in, to live well, to live in relationship with God, to live in relationship with each other and to live in relationship with the creation itself in ways that are are, are loving and sustainable uh, and healthy and, and giving us flourishing lives, it's a chance for us to say, What does God have to say about what is normal? What is the norm? So through this series, we're going to be thinking about these questions. Uh, What does it mean for us as individuals? What does it mean for us as a church? What does it mean for us as a society? That's going to be talks two, three, and four. But today, as we kick off, I want us to think about where we get our norms from and think about what God teaches us in his word and what God reveals to us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, And we're going to do that by having a bit of a look at Psalm 119 together. Now, we're not going to cover the whole of Psalm 119 uh, today. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, Psalm 119 is the longest of all the Psalms. It's the longest chapter in the whole Bible, weighing in at a massive 176 verses. Uh, That's too much to cover today. We're just going to cover this little section Uh, of eight verses. Psalm 119 is uh, an acrostic poem. Uh, If you don't know what an acrostic is, uh, here's one. I get given one every every Father's Day. Um, I don't know whether you can see that on your screen pretty well. This is one that Emily did for me when she was uh, in prep, where you take the letters of a word, in this case, super dad, uh, and each of those letters stand for something. So we've got Uh, super understanding, playful, excellent, really good, daddy, amazingly darling, uh, spells super dad. Well, Psalm 119 goes through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and there's eight verses on each letter. So uh, today's section was brought to you by the letter P, and if we were reading it in Hebrew, every one of those lines, every one of those verses would have started with a, a P in the Hebrew language. Uh, Every single verse in Psalm 118 refers to God's word. Either it says God's word or it uses a a parallel, a synonym for God's word. Uh, So in our passage today, uh, we've got statutes, words, commands, name, word, precepts, decrees, law. And the idea of going through the entire alphabet and every single line referring to God's word is to speak about how God's word covers every situation, all of life, all of the time, and directs us in our thinking. Uh, Don't be put off by that language of statutes or laws. Sometimes when we read that, we just think about rigid rules, or we think about dense legal documents that you read through eight times, and even then you've got no idea what they're talking about. In the Bible, to speak about God's God's law is, is a broader term. So the first five books of the Bible are referred to as books of the law, but they contain stories and songs, as well as what we'd recognise as as lists of rules. And all of that is considered God's law. So if you want to have a a biblical understanding of what God's law refers to when it talks about laws and statutes, it's really God's instructions for us for life, God's personal instructions to show us how to live well in the world that he has created for us, to live a flourishing life in that way. Uh, And it is personal. When we think about rules, we sometimes think about them as sort of distant. Um, It's not like God just sort of gives us a book of rules and says, here, uh, now go and do it. Did you notice that in the psalm as it was read, every time one of those words for God's word or law is referred to, it always has your in front of it. They are your statutes your words, your commands. That is, they come from God personally and are given to us. 
Um, it's connected to God. It's inspired by God's Holy Spirit. And he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can understand his words, relate to him and put them into practice. What's more, the God who gives these personal instructions is a good and loving God. Look at the way that God is described in our passage as well. He's a God who turns towards people and shows the mercy. That's in verse 132. He's a God who redeems people from oppression. He, He sets people free, releases us into a new freedom. Verse 134. He's a God who makes his face shine upon us and is gracious towards us. He blesses us with his presence. That's in verse 135. So we're we're talking about a God who is good, who is loving, who is for us and wants us to do well and to do life well. Um, Not some fusty bureaucrat wanting us to follow a set of rules just for the sake of it. Of course, as Christians, we know God's utter commitment to us his willingness to get involved in our lives and in our world, most fully through Jesus Christ. That in Jesus, who is God himself in human flesh, God comes amongst us and lives amongst us. Uh, And Jesus is described in the Bible as the word of God. That the way that God speaks to us is not only in the Bible, but also in the person of Jesus Christ who fully puts God's law into practice in his own life so that you can see uh, in the flesh, in a real body, what it looks like to live life well, to put into practice the laws and commands of God. Uh, Jesus fulfills a lot of those laws and commands as well. There are some things that he has done that we don't know, we don't have to do any longer. Things like the Old Testament sacrificial system, Jesus in his death on the cross deals with our sin, makes a sacrifice of himself so that our sins are paid for and we can be forgiven and in a relationship with God. So we see in Jesus how much God is committed to us. He's the word of God. And if you want to know what it looks like in practice, uh, look at Jesus. Uh, If you're new to Christianity, exploring what this is all about, the best place for you to start is to read one of the accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, um, one of the first four books of the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, look at the life of Jesus to see what it looks like for God's word to be lived out, for God's law to be put into practice. So God gives us his word um, so that it can shape the way that we live life. Now, what's going to happen if you start doing that, listen to what God has to say and start doing it. Well, this psalm, again, gives us some ideas as to what that's going to look like. Uh, In verse 130, it says that God's word gives light and understanding, that as we listen to God, our, our eyes are open. We can see the best way to live life and have a deeper understanding of how life works well. Uh, It says in verse 133 that that God's word directs our footsteps. Uh, One of the good things I've been doing during restrictions is is being really uh, good at getting out and running. Uh, But recently I got up a little too early on a shortened day and it was still dark when I started my run. Uh, And I run on sort of a back track out near our home and and it it was too dark to really see where I was putting my feet and it's uneven, and it was a bit wet and slippery, and it was really dangerous because I couldn't quite plant my feet confidently. I had to run really quite slowly and cautiously because I was worried about twisting my ankle or my knee. Uh, But the language here about God directing our footsteps shows that if we follow God's word, we can be confident in planting our feet in life, knowing the best way to do life as God directs us. It's a beautiful picture of the confidence that we can take as we follow God's word. The rest of verse 133 also talks about the fact that God directs our footsteps so that sin doesn't rule over us. It's the sort of language of being freed from oppression, being released from uh, sin, the, the, the wrong, wrong things that dominate our lives. Uh, we sometimes think, don't we, about God's 
word, God's rules, God's instructions, restricting us, limiting our freedom. But it's quite the opposite language that's being used here. That as we follow God's word, we're able to be released from the slavery of sin, uh, not being trapped by our own desires that can drive us unthinkingly to do things certain ways, uh, not being trapped by the way that our culture does things, which may be out of step with what God wants, uh, getting caught in bad habits and cycles of bad behaviour that can be oppressive and dominate us. Uh, down in Point Lonsdale, where we were last week, there's a wonderful playground for kids to play in right on the cliff top there. Now, it's really close to a really steep cliff into the water, but of course there's a fence along the cliff top. Uh, and it's great to see the kids playing freely, having a great time in safety because that fence is in place. Now, does that fence restrict their freedom? No, quite the opposite. They can play confidently and well because it's there. If you were to take that fence away, remove that barrier, that restriction, then the kids would actually become more fearful. They'd be less free to experiment and to play and they'd stay even further away from the edge because there's nothing to protect them and keep them safe. Uh, and God's word, God's laws for us are also helpfully giving us parameters for our lives so that we know what the boundaries are, so that we can be free to live in a good way and a healthy way under God and within the bounds that he set for us as our creator who loves us and wants the best for us. The last thing we can ask uh, from this psalm is, how do we respond uh, to God's word? Well, we need to be taught by it. We need to allow it to teach us. That's in verse 135. That is, we actually need to know what God's word says and understand it. But more than that, we also need to obey it. That's in verse 129 and 136. It's not just about knowing what God's word says to be able to repeat it. This is what God's instruction is. But actually, do we put it into practice? Do we obey it? Uh, Jesus, in his teaching, talked about uh, being a wise person is like uh, putting God's word into practice. It's like building a house on rock, but just hearing what God has to say and, and not doing it, not obeying it, is like trying to build a house on sand, which will get you nowhere. So we need to be taught by God's word. We need to obey God's word. Uh, and lastly, in this section of this psalm, we also need to long for God's word. That's in verse 131. It's quite evocative language that's being used here. It's about having your mouth open and, and almost panting for something. I, I think of uh, our dog Banjo when he's being fed. He sort of sits there watching you put the food in the bowl, he's, his mouth's open and the, there's, there's drool dripping out of the side of his mouth. It's that sort of desire and language for God's word. Now look, let me confess that when I get my Bible out in the morning to read it, I, I'm not doing that very often. There's not a whole lot of um, saliva stains on my Bible. Um, often it's doing it because I know it's a good thing and it's part of the routine. Uh, sometimes it feels like a bit of an obligation to do it. Uh, but one of the challenges for me as I've been reading this psalm and thinking about it is, is, is deepening that sense of longing for God's word. And I think uh, a key way that we need to do that is to give ourselves time to get into God's word, uh, to be creative and, and change up from time to time the way that we engage with what God has to say uh, and allow ourselves time for God's word to um, grow within us and to reflect on it and, and meditate on it so that it becomes part of our lives. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about that in this week's St John's Extra and show you a, a way or two that you might want to incorporate that in your life. So sign up for that at our website. There's a place you can click and sign up for St. John's Extra. But what I'm doing in my own reading of the Bible at the moment uh, is, is just working through a, a psalm each day or a section of a psalm each day and trying to find one verse that I write down, just one verse that stands out to me. And then I go over that verse through the day. I think about it. I pray about it and just allow that to soak in 
and, and deepen my longing uh, for what God has to say to me and listen to his voice uh, each day. So this psalm really challenges about the, the, the central place that God's word has uh, in setting the norms for us. So whether we're thinking about the old normal or the new normal, we need to compare those things to what God has to say, what his norms for us are. And as we think about stepping into a new future, we need to look at the vision that God has given us for what his future can be uh, in all of its beauty and guide our new future against the vision that God has given us as well. How can we do that as we chart a way forward? Well, here's a way that we've found helpful as a staff team as we've been talking about this, uh, as a way of, of, of thinking about how we might shape our lives and change our lives moving into the new normal. Uh, it's four buckets, and I've actually got four buckets as a way of, of helping us think about it. Firstly, we can think about what are the things that we've stopped uh, during the time of restrictions that we don't want to go back to? What are the things that we've changed that we actually want to adopt those changes? What are some new things that we might have started that we want to keep? Uh, there's also some things that we've had to do uh, out of necessity. Uh, you know, we've been told to do it, we have to do it. And we actually don't want to keep those as part of the new future. We'd be happy to let them go. Now, you could be really physical. You could have four buckets, like I've got four buckets. And you could actually write on pieces of paper what things belong in each of those buckets. Or you could just write a list. You could talk about it as uh, families. You can talk about it as friends. We want you to talk about it as life groups. And we've got some studies for each of these uh, talks that we're encouraging people to talk through these things together. The idea is to actually be deliberate, to be proactive and to think about how best we can move into a new future, uh, create a new normal. Uh, and with all of these buckets, this is not just about our own preferences, our own desires, but to actually ask the question for each of these things, how do they compare to what God has to say to us, to the norms that he has given us. Now, some of that might be uh, easy as we come to God's word. There are explicit commands in God's word that tell us things that we should do and that we shouldn't do. So, for example, you know, very clearly uh, in the Bible, we're told, do not steal and do not murder. Um, now, if we've stopped doing those things out of necessity or whatever during uh, restrictions, don't go back to them. That's pretty obvious. But most things are less clear than that, aren't they? Um, most of the changes and things that we've had to adapt to have been less obvious in terms of the instructions in God's word, whether to do them or not. Uh, things like priorities. Uh, there might be things that as we've been under this period of restriction that we've, we've had to adjust our priorities because we haven't been able to do some of the things that we'd normally do. But as we reflect on them, we think maybe those things had too much of a place in our lives. Uh, maybe they had become higher in our priorities or deeper in our loves and they pushed God to the side. Um, we often talk about these sorts of things as being, being idols. Idols are things that they're good things in and of themselves, but if we love them more, or serve them more, or become uh, more wrapped up in them than we are by God, then they become unhelpful and out of whack with the way things good, should be uh, as followers of Jesus. And maybe there's a few things like that, that as you stop and you reflect on it, you think, yeah, life was a bit out of whack. The priorities were a bit messed up, or I was loving some things a little bit too much and things need to change. I really do feel that 
we're at a period in our lives, in a period in our history, where we, have, we really do have a God-given opportunity to make some changes, to make some positive and proactive changes. God is a God who can bring good things out of bad situations. Coronavirus has been bad. The restrictions have been hard. And maybe going back into restrictions has been particularly hard and challenging for you and you're not quite sure how you're going to face it. But God is a God who works for good for those who love him. God is a God who can bring good things out of bad situations. And the opportunity for us that we don't want to miss is to ask ourselves, what is the good that can come out of this? What are the changes that we can make? What are the things in our lives, in our church, in our society, where we can realign and create a new normal which is much more lined up with the norms that God has given us in his word. What are the possibilities to go back to a new future, which is much more in keeping with the beautiful vision for the future that God has given us in his word, and most importantly, through his son, Jesus Christ, who models for us in his own life the beauty and the truth of God and shows us the best way to live. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek.